very much, Eva, and thank you, um, uh, Simon and Eva, for the invitation to address you today. Uh, as Eva said, I'm Mary Rose Burke, and I work for the Chamber of Commerce. I'm there about 18 months. Very many of your organisations are members, so that means you're all members as well, so you're welcome to come along to any events there. Um, well, I was listening to Andrew, um, you know, I always try to take at least one thing away that's really, really useful from every speaker I hear. And the big thing I'll be taking away from Andrews is my young fellow bought a pair of runners that apparently now cost more than a 3D printer. <laughs> They're getting packed off on the post we turned to spin on that buy a 3D printer. Um, well, I was delighted when Simon said when I speak at this tech forum and I thought that's great how I write down everything I know about tech and I'll uh, speak. But then I've heard about the wonderful uh, inputs you've had from Gary and from Beatrice and um, Louis earlier. And, then I was getting a little bit nervous as Andrew was talking. I was thinking, okay, Microsoft, maybe he knows more than me about IT and technology and stuff. Um, that kind of cold feeling really caught me when I was putting my hand up about the augmented reality, but I'm glad he didn't ask me my experience because it's limited to silent discos, so I don't think that's what he was talking about. <laughs> and then when Phil sat beside me and said he was speaking after me, I said, you know what, maybe just uh, kind of rip up the technology at all. <laughs> and if you don't mind, I kind of hook on the global piece and say, okay, I do know something about global, so maybe we could uh, talk a little bit about that. Um, probably preaching a little bit to the audience in the room, um, but I think it's no harm sometimes to remind ourselves of why everybody's here, why we're here in Crow Park, why, why the stadium's here, and why Dublin is a bit of our centre of our universe. Um, many of you will have heard the Taoiseach talking about that Ireland isn't uh, um, an island on the periphery of Europe, it's an island at the centre of the world, and that we bridge, uh, because of cultural and historical reasons, we bridge uh, that America through Europe and onwards. And because we are a committed member of the um, EU and of the Eurozone, but yet we have that very Anglo-Saxon approach built on deep, deep relationships with the US and the presence of the US companies right through since the early 60s in Ireland, and also with the historical, cultural, business and personal relationships with the UK. So we are ultimately there um, and able to help bridge. We also in the Chamber, we operate the Ireland Hong Kong Business Forum on behalf of the Hong Kong Trade and Development Commission. And again, we see our role uh, as, a, as a Chamber, but also as, as Irish people in putting other people together. It's what we're good at, it's about building connectivity, and um, uh, those networks are virtual and real. And we know that belonging and gathering and personal relationships are actually what underpins successful teamworking, successful innovation, creativity and everything that feeds into the, your day jobs and your, your world. So rather than be threatened by this, actually Ireland and Dublin is in a much better place than maybe in previous, like the Industrial Revolution, we were okay in agriculture, but then along came the Industrial Revolution. And now when we talk about um, the, the, the whole change that's going to happen in terms of technology, you know what, you don't need a natural resource for that. You don't need oil coming out of the ground and you don't necessarily need sunshine. What you do need is creative and curious people and if we're anything, what are we? Curious. We all like to know things about other people and how things work. So we should have a unique advantage in this area and we like putting people together. So how often is it, you know, I don't know the answer, but I know a fellow who does. So that's actually what's going to be important in the future, knowing how to source the, the, the information and put people together. And if you look at why do we think and why are we so confident that Dublin is actually in this global uh, centre and that's for all industries but as a global tech hub well actually the proof of the pudding is in the e eating the tech companies are deciding to be here for a myriad of reasons and some of that because of the clustering effect of creativity about reputation about all the things that makes Dublin wonderful and if you look at what some of those are I mean absolutely have we a tax advantage we do we're loud and proud about it is that enough to attract and retain big companies that can negotiate um, with other areas? No, it's not. But we provide an awful lot more. We have that Anglo-Saxon Anglo background and the US mentality and experience of doing business with, but we're also a very stable pro-business economy, fiscally stable as well as politically stable. And what happened, um, in, even though if you were to go down to your local pub tonight, it's all down to one or two people, uh, all with names and the vitriol is focused on those. And we keep deluding ourselves that what happened in Ireland was part of a worldwide thing. Yes, we had a banking crisis. Yes, we had a public service, um, a pu public uh, finance crisis and a construction crisis. 
but it all happened in the context of a worldwide crash and it wasn't down to one or two simple ideas or some simple problems. Um, so, but by being very global, by being very open, the price we pay for that is when the global economy rises, we rise. When there's a global shock, we suffer the shock and sometimes a bit quicker. However, we've seen um, through that fiscal uh, focus uh, imposed rather than volunteered in some ways, we've also recovered much stronger, much faster than anybody else. And we're now on a growth trajectory of about 4%, 3 to 4% per annum in the longer term. We would often think what happened is a speed bump. And I don't mean in any way to reduce the impact that it had on individuals, families and businesses. People lost businesses, lost family homes, lost relationships, lost a lot of money. Uh, that happens, and I don't mean to, to reduce the impact of that. But if you look at it from a macro term, we were on a growth trajectory um, coming out of a low base from our uh, lack of an industrial past. We hit a speed wobble, a major speed wobble crisis, whatever you call it, but we're back on a growth trajectory. You can think of it as getting on the slip road onto a motorway. When you come off it, you have to go a little bit slower and then you have to go a bit faster on the slip road to catch up to the traffic again. And we're seeing that as acceleration to get back on to cruise control at 3 to 4% annual growth. There are challenges out there. Brexit being one of them, but a lot of other global challenges. You know, if something major happens in America, be it policy driven or whatever, there's consequences for us. Something happens in China, there's consequences for us. However, we see those as challenges that will maybe uh, Brexit could take one, maybe two percent off our GDP, but it's not going to put us into a recession. It's not going to put us into negative territory. It is lost growth, but we're still going to be growing. So just not growing quite as fast. If you look at kind of why Dublin. Um, well, it's, it's the economic, it's the uh, social, cultural and uh, financial capital of the city. The Greater Dublin area, which is where the businesses I represent are based, um, it, it, it's half the jobs, half the GDP, half the tax take in the country. So it is the economic powerhouse. And before we get all our county jerseys on, if, the, if we were a part of China or Russia or America, we would be just a region with one strong economic, internationally competitive city in it. We wouldn't be trying to have five cities within a region 400 by 200 miles. So no apologies for saying that Dublin really is the powerhouse of, of um, the country and that wealth has to be created in Dublin for it to be able to be redistributed around the rest of the country. Um, outside of Dublin, two counties are net contributors to the exchequer. So for anybody to benefit, we need to create the wealth and that means both investment in indigenous businesses in Dublin and also continuing to be attractive to um foreign FDI. Um, so if you look at um, that growth, the strongest growth in, in um, the Eurozone and um, that forecast to go on, fiscal security uh, the, um, and stability, while the, the Euro amount of our national debt is still high, it's really only the ratios that matter. And you can either pay down the debt or you can increase the top line. That's what we've done through that growth. And so our um, debt ratio is now um, much more attractive by about 10 points. Uh, below that of the UK, 83 to 73%, 72% in Ireland. Um, global competitiveness, Ireland does very well. It's ranked as the sixth most competitive in the world, up, up from a 7%. And our, our, um, our competition isn't some of the other countries or uh, cities that we might think it is. It's very much Hong Kong, Switzerland, Singapore. That's our competitor set. It's not Cork and Limerick. Like We, we bring them with us. Uh, we're not competing with our own colleagues there at all. Um, we do very well on attracting and retaining talent. Now, I know very many of you will have open jobs that you cannot fill, but relative to other places, relative to our competitor cities, we're still doing well at attracting and retaining talent. And then if you walk around the place, you can see the vibrant multicultural population that's in Dublin. Very different from when I was in college in Dublin in the 80s. Um, there was only 3.3 million of us uh, in the Republic at the time, we have 4.6 million now. But in Dublin, one in five of those are not born in Dublin. People are choosing to come from around the world to make their life, uh, to grow their business, to uh, develop their career here. Some will stay forever, some won't, but we do the same passing through other places. So what it means to be Irish, what it means for our work and labour force is very different now. And we need to challenge any... any um, concepts or biases or prejudices that we have in terms of what we believe to be the Irish workforce. The Irish workforce, the Dublin workforce, 
is very, very multicultural. I was speaking to Jason Lawler from MasterCard yesterday, 300 people in, in their operation, 20 different nationalities. And obviously the tech companies would be the ones that will see most of that. So all of you know that this is the reality, this is the workplace in Dublin. And I think it's fantastic the way that has happened so quickly, so seamlessly. And, and it's learning to see how more we can do in that space. We're very attractive for international students, again, around personal security, around that English speaking and recognised um, network around the world as well. So we compete very favourably with universities. If you look at education in general, we've one of the most uh, educated work um, or educated workforces um, in, in the world. Uh, way higher than the OECD average when you look at our 25 to 34 year olds, um, just over half of them have a third level qualification. OECD average is about 43. So we really do quite well on that. And some of us that have come through the education system, it's easy to criticise it, but we only ever have the experience of that one. Um, when you look at the success of people who have come through the Irish education system and the global success they have had in some of the businesses represented here, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. The education system has delivered some very fine leaders in all disciplines and all um, sectors across the world. That's not to say that we shouldn't continue to innovate on that, um, but we should recognise that elements of the education center are uh, of education system are very, very good. We need to continue to improve, but actually our graduates are uh, uh, out there with the best in the world. Um, we rank top 10 for quality of education and the university education, education meeting the needs of a competitive economy, and also crucially for knowledge transfer between uh, companies and the um, educational institutions, which is a critical one. Um, Equally, when we talk about a crisis in STEM, 30% of the graduates in 15, 16 academic year were doing STEM subjects. So it's not enough, we need more, but 30% is actually not bad at all. Um, then if you look at just diversity, I touched on it already, but because of our uh, committed uh, future within the EU, that means that companies based in Dublin have access to a pool of 500 million people. Um, you know, it's a no-brainer. It's such a competitive advantage to us, particularly if the UK are leaving, because um, I still say if, I'm not quite sure that that's <laughs> actually going to happen. Um, but more about that another time. The, um, if you look at cost competitiveness, um, a, again, a lot of you in the room will know that compared to other competing sister organisations within your groups or um, uh, within your sector, that uh, cost competitive in Dublin is, is high. I've mentioned the 12.5% flat corporate tax rate. The importance sometimes around the defence of the corporate tax rate is not the actual 12.5% per se. What it is important is about uh, stability and um, a, a permanent arrangement. Companies don't like tax rates that change. Not necessarily, they don't like them going down either too much as well as up. They, they just want stability. They just want information that they can work with and plan. They don't want volatility in those kind of things. Um, Again, that's a well-known part of our global business brand. It's half of the OECD average, and it's one of the lowest in Europe. But there's all other elements, as well as the headline tax rate, that make it a very attractive place for global investment. And some of that would be the enhancements to the R&D tax credits, um, the 25% R&D tax credit that's in place, um, the IP regime that has been put in place, um, which is fairly broadly defined and works quite well. And we have an OECD compliant knowledge box. So. It's in the much done, more to do space, but we do need to, um, and, 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 as investment is mobile and global, equally so must our proposition be uh, global, mobile and flexible. We need to continue to do that. As well as having a very competitive tax regime in terms of what the offer is, we also rank very, uh, very highly as in number one in ease of paying taxes. So we make it less painless. It's, it's an attractive, fairly simple regime and we make it easy for people to pay it um, in, in terms of the revenue and technology and all of that. Um, if you look at labour costs, they've remained fairly stable since 2012. Uh, because of the crisis, we've had that dampening of inflation worldwide, and that has moderated wage demand. Again, in the tech sector, obviously, that's uh, slightly different, and you'll see in certain roles um, uh, wage inflation. But uh, across the board, uh, wage inflation is fairly stable. Now, that's not to say that everything is rosy, and part of my job is to be a cheerleader and an ambassador for Dublin. Um, it kind of goes with the job. And, and we've just launched our new strategy 2018 to 2020 uh, based on very wide consultation with a lot of stakeholders and with our own members. 
And the vision that we've articulated in that is that Dublin would be globally renowned for its quality of life and economic vibrancy. So our mission within that is to help businesses succeed in a successful Dublin. So everything we are doing is either supporting businesses and the business environment or supporting Dublin and the competitiveness of the city. The more we make the city competitive, individual businesses will grow and flourish themselves. Um, I think for myself, you know, in, in curling, like we're the ones who go along brushing all the obstacles out of the way because the people hitting the ball know what they're doing. I don't need to get involved there. We just need to make sure that the environment is, is supportive. So we, we do have some challenges and um, housing is one of the biggest ones. When we survey our members now of the top three challenges, interesting in the last year, housing would never have come up as an employer and business leaders issue. It is their number one issue now because where they are able to attract and uh, find the people that they want, they're losing good people or they're finding people accept a role and then find that they can't find accommodation or not acceptable or affordable accommodation. So that is a real issue. However, it is, it's an issue of success. Um, yes, short-term failure to invest and build houses, but compared to, we'll say, in the 80s, when people were leaving this country in their droves, sometimes we don't realise that in the crisis years, the population went up by 350. It's like a new county cork being bolted onto the country with no additional infrastructure, quite aside from the demand for housing that was just there from family formation and the normal demand you would have. So the, we've the demographic pressure and growth, but that's a good thing. We, we need more people. And we would envision an island maybe of 10 million people by 2050. So we think the government projections of maybe a, another one and a half million uh, in the Republic are quite, quite modest. We do see that there's long-term population growth there. Um, we haven't really, we're seeing the impact of some of that housing shortage because most of you will know that colleagues and your teens are talking about it, but but they're still here and they're still managing to find something, even if it's unacceptable. We're beginning to see now where people are leaving jobs, um, moving to different parts of the country or leaving the country, um, particularly those that have been attracted from other countries are leaving because of the housing. So we do need to deal with it. But it's like turning the Titanic. There are a lot of things going on. There's 1.9 billion invested in the budget or announced in the budget last October. So, but it takes time to get there. When the housing issue gets resolved, of course it will, it just takes time. Um, cold comfort for anybody, you know, caught up in it, um, including myself. I'm renting since I moved to Dublin, so I know exactly what it's like. Um, and we need more action. So it's probably the number one issue that we're lobbying government on behalf of business. Um, and, and some strange bedfellows, actually, sometimes when you pick issues like that, that wouldn't be a traditional business issue, but you find you have common cause with, we'll say, pretty much councillors and TDs across um, all shades of the political spectrum. And sometimes they're surprised that the voice of business is talking about housing. But um, And we talk about social housing as well as the private sector housing as well. Um, I mentioned that being highly globalised, that we're very vulnerable to shocks and, and that... Um, so we have to keep broadening our offering, making sure we constantly are meeting the need for uh, tax competitiveness, uh, talent competitiveness, quality of life. And again, particularly in the tech sector where the investment is mobile and can move, people, senior people in particular, will choose where they wish to live. Um, and funny old thing, they try not to live in horrible places uh, that are run down no matter how wealthy you are you still need the public realm to be attractive you want a health system that works you want to be able to educate your children you want them to be able to go outside the door without being caught 